This is CBC Here and Now. Seeing the gauze, take it and drop it and eat it. Like today, like just seeing this, I never thought I'd see it. See her she's working in the plant. Here at home, they're fit for the birds, but a world away in Osaka, they are considered a delicacy. Tonight, we take you to a plant in Ramia where workers are getting a crash course in uni. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. Well, falling snow isn't just causing trouble for those on the roads. It's also trouble for air travelers. Hundreds of people delayed getting into St. John's today. A flight from Toronto to YYT turned around a mere 20 minutes shy of touching down. The CBC's Meg Roberts has more. That's the Air Canada customer service line at Pearson Airport earlier this morning. Those passengers were all on a flight heading to St. John's. But just about 20 minutes shy of reaching the city, their flight was forced to turn around. Once in Toronto again, some were quickly ushered onto the next available flight. The CBC's Jacob Barker happened to be on board. A lot of grunting, a lot of groaning. Uh, some complaining for sure. Uh, and I know, you know, when we were turning the plane around, we're flying over everybody's connecting flights. A lot of people were connecting into Gander and into Deer Lake and places like that. And, you know, you're watching those uh, destinations pass right under you. It can be a little bit frustrating. The runways are just not in a position that an aircraft of this size can land on them. So it's, they're doing their best to clean it up. According to the St. John's Airport, the large plane couldn't land on the shorter runway because of poor conditions. And it says at the time, the longer runway was closed, meaning some of the travelers spent more than nine hours in the air today trying to get from Toronto to St. John's. I think I'm more frustrated at the fact that we were, you know, over... Newfoundland uh, and they told us that they couldn't land because the runway wasn't cleared and so instead of flying us all the way back to Newfoundland we were all kind of wondering well why don't they just call it plow would have been a lot cheaper. Here I am I'm already home in Bay Roberts and I got to turn around go right on back to Toronto again Woo. And, and then I thought about you know my relatives and children you know waiting. According to Air Canada, returning to Toronto was optimal for customers given the uncertainty of the length of the runway closure. In the past week, there have been a number of cancellations and delays from flights coming in and out of St. John's. And with some bad weather on the horizon, it's hard to tell when travelers can expect some smoother sailing. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, from snowy runways now to snowy streets, since Christmas Eve, the Avalon has seen 100 centimeters of snow. And while we often focus on staying safe behind the wheel, you can't forget about the walkers who are out there. This week's storm has forced many off the sidewalks and onto the slushy streets. And earlier today, the CBC's Malone Mullen spoke with pedestrians in St. John's about the challenges of just trying to stay safe. I often walk my dog, walk him twice a day. And I, um, I have to walk them on the side of the road most of the time because the, uh, the sidewalks and, and whatnot, unless people have cleared it themselves, uh, they're just completely impassable. It would be a lot better if they uh, did a better job of clearing the sidewalks and, and, and stuff like that because uh, it is, you know, pedestrians do need these sidewalks. Do you ever have to clamber over any snow banks, anything like that? Uh, when cars are coming, yeah. I mean, we just had to do it down there. and. Like, it would be nice if the sidewalks were cleared. It's obviously not convenient, but it's nothing we haven't dealt with before. A lot of drivers don't recognize that uh, you have to, like, anticipate crosswalks. So before you know it, they're on top of you, and also they inch forward while you're attempting to get across the street. And you still have everything else to think about, certainly, like, the slush and other cars splashing you. Like, you know, if they don't slow down, the mud and, and the wet everything slush splashes up all over your clothes so that's a bit annoying. The drivers are quite cautiously like they drive cautiously they like take care of whoever is walking on the road so it's not a problem. I've never faced any problem like this yet. Avoid obviously taking the uh, the worst sidewalks and the worst streets and as long as you're being safe and trying to stay closest to the side of the street as possible I think that's what's important now it would be nice, but uh, obviously it's probably not in the city's budget and you know, not everything can get done. And with even more snow on the way, the city of St. John's is updating us on yesterday's storm, as well as what the city is doing to prepare for tomorrow night. Now today we've got a one day break, so we are going to be downtown tonight doing snow removal. 
and tomorrow unfortunately we have more snow coming so we will switch gears again and go back to salting and plowing snow until that event is over and once an event is over as well it takes us a little while to get all the widening done so generally about 24 hours after the storm stops we'll be doing pushback and widening before then we'll switch gears again and go back into removal and there's another warning tonight about ice safety, and this one is directed at people in coastal Labrador. The freeze up along the north coast is late this year, and there isn't as much ice as usual, especially since there has been a week of warm temperatures. So search and rescue officials in Nain are asking people to be careful before they head out onto the sea ice and to make sure to check first that the ice is safe. <laughs> That's really good advice because yes, those temperatures were warm over the last week or so and they've dropped. So that might fool you a little bit. Uh, as you woke up this morning, Nain was sitting at minus 20. So back to those seasonal temperatures across the board. We saw some cool temperatures uh, across most of the island as well. Here's where we sat as our daytime highs, minus 16 in Nain. Temperature around minus two for St. John's, minus seven for Deer Lake. So those temperatures climbed quite nicely uh, this afternoon. Now uh, we do have a little bit of a low pressure system moving through. That's bringing some light snow through parts of the island, otherwise pretty quiet. The next system that I'm watching, uh, which was just mentioned a little bit earlier, is that low pressure system sitting off uh, the coast of the U.S. right now. It's going to ramp up and head our way as we head into uh, tomorrow and Thursday. It's going to bring windy conditions, some snow to uh, parts of the western uh, portion of Newfoundland and then some rain potentially for the east. So we'll have all those details coming up. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the province says it's happy with how the Amber Alert system worked last week. The minister responsible says despite a delay in sending the alert to phones, televisions and radios, everything worked quite well. There's been criticism for a two hour delay between when the Amber Alert was issued and when people received the notifications. Derek Bragg says it took police an hour to notify his department and then an hour for the government to send out the alert. This was the first time that provincial officials have used the emergency system since it was launched in 2018. Bragg says everyone involved has learned more about the system for when it's needed next time. Well, a fish plant in Ramya has started exporting a Japanese delicacy, sea urchin. And to get the prickly shipments going, the buyer sent some help. Two technicians who flew in from Japan. The CBC's Adam Walsh with this story. Urchins by the thousand are being cracked open in Ramya's sole fish plant. Overseeing the operation are two Japanese technicians brought in from Osaka by the plant's owner. They are really try to uh, get uh, uh, processing for sea urchin skill. Kiyosuke Nishio and his colleague are teaching the ins and outs of processing. And there's a lot to learn if you're shipping product to a picky foreign market. Uh, most of Japanese people like uh, very light yellow, like a lemon color, lemon, and a light orange is a uh, more good root color, and dark brown and like a gray or something, so they don't, they don't eat you know, much. So far, so good. Yeah, Lamia has a uh, big potential, I think. The plant processes scallops for part of the year, but this new operation means for the first time in over a quarter of a century, the lights are on in winter. But there are challenges. One of them, the distance. Oh, and the shelf life for fresh sea urchin is only about 12 days. Processed urchin leaves Ramia by ferry, then it's up the Burgio Highway and across the Trans-Canada to St. John's. Then it's loaded on a plane and sent to Japanese cities like Tokyo and Osaka, where, possibly within a few days, it's served like this and considered a delicacy. Quite the difference from the reputation here in this province. We always caught it, horse eggs growing up, seeing the galls take it and drop it and eat it. Like today, like just seeing this, I never thought I'd see it. See it just working in the plant, mm -hmm. but it, it's wonderful. And the learning curve for processing is working out as well. It's going good, actually, better than I thought. Like it's new to us. It's the first time we ever done sea urchins, so there's a lot to learn and a lot to take in. If it all works out, there could be a lot more to take in. Just ask this sea urchin expert. 
We're lucky enough in the province uh, because we have lots of uh, green sea urchin. That's the only species we have here in the province, but it happens to be the uh, species that they're looking for in the Asian markets. A sentiment echoed by Ramya's plant owner. They got no tails. They will swim uh, nowhere. So uh, knowing that you got this uh, wonderful resource firmly attached to your uh, sea bottom is, uh, is, is a great comfort. And also a comfort for here in Ramia, an island of fewer than 500 people where extra employment could help stabilize a population that's been decreasing for decades. Adam Walsh, CBC News, Ramia. This couple of weeks we've got calls from Flat Rock, we've got them from Holyrood, uh, we've got from Bay Roberts, these sorts of things. Well, if you're noticing seals out of the water and laying along the shoreline, you are not alone. Federal Fisheries is receiving numerous sightings, and tonight we'll tell you what you should do and should not do if you see one. Well, the year-end fireworks show quickly became a hot topic in St. John's, you might recall, when Council decided to move the display. Rather than the traditional midnight New Year's Eve send-off, City Hall opted to move the event bring it back to 8 p.m. And the time change caused a bit of pushback in the city with people voicing their opinions online and through emails to councillors. One person even started a petition against it. But in the end, it appears the city's move paid off with thousands showing up to see the sky over Kitty Vitty light up. Anytime there's changes, uh, you know, it can, it can affect some people differently than others. Uh, the changes turned out well. So in 2018, so last year, we had around 1,500 to 2,000 people down at Clancy Drive and Carnell Drive at Kitty Vitty. This year, the numbers tripled. We estimate somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 people, mostly families, and a lot of new Canadians showed up this time. So uh, overwhelming success, and we're very happy with that. Well, it started as a joke three years ago, but it looks like the successful Murbys calendar, which has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for local charities, it's coming to an end. Founder Hassan Hai says the 2020 calendar will likely be the group's last. Hai is with the NL Beard and Mustache Club, which is now turning its attention to other projects, including a possible cartoon, as well as a CBC documentary on the Murbys. Much of the money the group raised so far went to Spirit Horse NL as well as Violence Prevention Newfoundland and Labrador. And while the calendar is done for now, High isn't closing the door completely to a future printing. The St. John's Edge are back. After playing six games on the road, the home team is having their home opener at Mile One Stadium against the KW Titans. I'm live down here at mile one and I'll have all the stories coming up on Here and Now.
It's not like in prison, everyone's sitting around talking about how they want to be rehabilitated. It's more a talk of like what crimes they're going to do when they get out. Unless you want to actually change yourself, it doesn't make a difference. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. Well, Happy New Year. Happy Haven't New seen you in a Year. while. I know. You've been busy with all this snow you've been conjuring up for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Did you like it? <laughs> Actually, you know what? Between Christmas and New Year, I know the shoveling and all that, and we've got more coming, mm -hmm. but to go snowshoeing and skiing, probably more this time than all of last year. So Absolutely. But shoveling it and getting rid of it yesterday was another thing. But before we go on about the snow mm. and the cold and all that, because mm. you'll get to that, mm -hmm. I have a different kind of story for you. A video that's uh, make you feel a little warmer, perhaps. <laughs> the struggle is real when it comes to shoveling. This is a 14 month year. <laughs> his name's Rory. Trying to help his dad shovel. This is in Clarenville. And uh, there he is helping his dad. <laughs> Blunk. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Mom and Samantha Berg Balsam for sharing that. Set him, great. set him up right. I can't stop watching it. It just. <laughs> it's almost like the shovel's helping him go. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It, oh. uh, yeah, it's crazy. Boop. And then just stand him up and he keeps on going. It needs to be a gif. That is uh, remarkable. Very cute, Rory. It's been shared yeah, a lot of times. Yeah, you're going to uh, probably be on uh, the Ellen show before the end of the week. Hey, who knows? you never who know. Knows? Maybe. Now, for those of us who don't have a Rory, yes, I wish we all had a Rory. Our snow for us, yeah. yeah, we're gonna need a Rory. Uh, yep, in parts of uh, on parts of the island, As absolutely, we we're gonna need some more. Today, though, it's kind of nice. Looked nice outside. Gently falling snow. I haven't seen my driveway yet, but it looked pretty. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. Yeah, and uh, that's thanks to the fact that that low pressure system has uh, gone offshore now, which is good news. Got another little area of low pressure just e uh, to the uh, west of the island, and that's bringing the chance of some flurries. And you can see if I zoom in here, you can see some of those flurries across the island and then uh, for the west coast as well. Now what's going to happen as we head through the overnight is the chance of flurries will continue and or light snow for most of the island. Not a whole lot going on though. Maybe pick up a centimeter or two again uh, for some of us and then quiet up through Labrador. But those temperatures uh, are going to be cold yet again. So back down to the minus 20s. Not quite as cold as yesterday, uh, but we are still going to see some westerly winds 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Lab City, uh, you'll be sitting around minus 21, minus 22 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Generally clear skies for most of you. And then the island back down to about minus five for St. John's. Those winds will stay light overnight. So if you're planning on getting out and enjoying that, you certainly can. Minus nine for Corner Brook and then minus 14 for uh, St. Anthony again with that chance of flurries moving through. Next system moves in. This one uh, already prompting a number of warnings. So here's a look at them. We'll just show you what they are now. So winter storm warnings along the west coast, the interior, Green Bay, White Bay, uh, Bay of Exploits and Grand Falls, Windsor. As you head a little bit further east, that's a special weather statement and then wind warnings uh, for the Avalon and then blowing snow advisories. Now with this system, the winds are going to stay strong. So I've added uh, these lines here. These are isobars. The tighter these lines are together, the stronger the winds, just to kind of show you the timing of that. And uh, so as far as that snowfall goes, it'll move in by tomorrow afternoon. It's going to move north fairly quickly. Uh, so by supper time tomorrow, most of the island will be under uh, snow or seeing some snow and strong winds. Again, tighter these lines are together, the stronger the winds into the evening hours. That's when it'll change over to rain, mainly for uh, eastern Newfoundland along the south coast, Conagra Peninsula, Buren Peninsula. You're likely going to see things change over to rain and or drizzle and then back over to snow as we head through the overnight as that low pressure system moves in. You'll notice a little bit of relief from those winds as well as that low moves in. So here's the numbers as far as those winds go. By tomorrow evening, up to 90 kilometers per hour, even 100 kilometers per hour in some exposed areas. Uh, a little bit less on the west coast, but still quite strong, anywhere from 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. By Thursday morning, early Thursday morning, upwards of 115 to maybe even 120 kilometers per hour. And then widespread areas of strong winds continuing as we head through the day on Thursday. So this one is going to be windy, hence those winter storm warnings. Anywhere on the west, that's where you're going to stay is mainly snow, 20 to 30 centimeters for uh, the southwest. It looks like heading a little bit further east, 10 to 20. 
and then that rain mixes in for the Avalon. Still looking at anywhere between 5 to about 15 centimeters of snow. Those temperatures are going to jump up and these temperatures that you're seeing here will mainly be in the evening hours. They're going to climb as we head through the day. About minus 3, uh, minus 4 along the co west coast, Corner Brook. Uh, there you go for your temperatures and then again above zero for most of the eastern Newfoundland and the south coast as well. Harbour Breton hovering around the three degree mark. It's quiet up through Labrador. You're going to enjoy mostly sunshine tomorrow. Minus 13 for Cartwright, minus 15 for Lab City with uh, that chance of flurries. But again, those winds will stay light. So that's a little bit of an outlook at tomorrow's forecast. We'll talk about Thursday and how much more snow is coming when I come back. We'll stay with the weather on the other side of the world, though. Lower temperatures today have given Australian firefighters a chance to step up some preemptive measures aimed at containing almost 200 still smoldering wildfires. But government officials are using the break to brace for more difficult times ahead. 26 lives have already been lost. Um, we have unaccounted for people across Australia. We have over 1,800 homes have been destroyed, and that's before we even begin to count the cost of public places, of schools, um, the heartbeat of some of these communities. Now, the emotional toll has been staggering. Thousands left homeless and thousands more no longer have places to go to work. The devastation is vast. In a once picturesque seaside village, dead birds and charred debris litter the beaches. Police have been patrolling some regions to stop looters from getting into abandoned homes. And in the relative lull, weary firefighters work on setting backfires, you see there, to stop further damage in areas that escape the full brunt of the flames. The CBC's David Common is in a national park south of Sydney with an up-close look at the fire management strategy of one crew. As Australian firefighters head into Friday, they know that the heat is going to pick back up. And so they're making an effort to try to cool down all of the areas that have already been burnt. You see that effort going on here in the bush, in the forest. They're hosing down these areas that could once again reignite, particularly when we head into Friday when those temperatures are going to be back. So cooling this down will deny the opportunity for the fire to jump the road over there and continue its progression. When it moved through here before, we're being told that the temperatures were above 100 degrees Celsius, that water, in fact, was boiling inside tanks on some of the fire trucks. That gives you a sense of the intensity of a fire that was, at, at one point, many kilometers wide with 20 meter high uh, flames. They know that kind of possibility could resume, and they're looking inside this because this is very, very hot. Uh, they're using heat guns to really get a sense of what's going on there, using the water to try to cool it to prevent the possibility of more danger happening. Now, of course, this comes as there are thousands of firefighters uh, being deployed right across Australia, particularly in coastal areas. Uh, many people coming in from other areas, including many Canadians. We know that when Canadian firefighters arrived just the other day at the airport, they were cheered by many people because the help is so needed. Now, they're only a small part of the firefighting effort here, which is really led largely by volunteers. Most of these people, the vast majority of them, are Australian volunteers, part of the largest volunteer firefighting force in the entire world. And they've been busy. And they know they're going to be, continue to be busy for quite some time to come. Well, in other news, Canada's top military commander is formally suspending operations in Iraq. It comes as NATO allies deal with the fallout from the U.S. targeted killing of a top Iranian military commander. In a letter released today, General Jonathan Vance says, Over the coming days, some of our people will be moved temporarily from Iraq to Kuwait. Simply put, we're doing this to ensure their safety and their security. He adds that despite the operational pause in Iraq, our mission in the Middle East carries on with multiple other operations in the region. Canada has approximately 800 members of the military deployed in the Middle East, with about 500 troops in Iraq involved in two separate missions. Now, in Iran, meantime, at least 56 people died and more than 200 others were injured after a stampede during the funeral procession for the Iranian general. Thousands of mourners packed the streets as the casket was taken through Qasem Soleimani's hometown. There's no information on what triggered the crush. The issue of overcrowding prompted authorities to delay today's burial ceremony. 
Many Iranians considered Soleimani a national hero, even as others saw him as the regime's brutal enforcer. Tehran and its close allies are renewing their threats to avenge his assassination. And Iran's parliament voted today to designate the U.S. military and the Pentagon as terrorists. Where will the horses play? This gentleman has volunteered. He's blowing the snow. You'll see a member of the RNC over there who's also shoveling the snow. How are they going to find the room for the horses to play? Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, so far on the program, we've talked about airline passengers, pedestrian safety, but how are horses faring under all of the snow? Well, Rainbow Riders in St. John's is having a particularly challenging time this season. Earlier today, I swung by to speak with Kelly Sandoval. 
The challenge is that this is only our second winter here in our new facility and the first time we've had to deal with a snowfall of this magnitude. So we were kind of caught a little unprepared. We do have a tractor with a, um, a snow blowing attachment. However, that cannot get inside these paddocks. And our horses are on day two now where they've been in the stalls and of course not good for them. They need, they start to show signs of stress if they're if they're inside too, too long, just like people. Yeah, we all need exercise after Christmas, but horses Absolutely. really like to get it every day, right? Absolutely, and it's important for our program horses to be able to perform uh, in program, so, yeah. So, so I'm looking at the, the guys behind. It's got a snowblower and a gentleman from the RNC shoveling. You've got nine paddocks? We have nine paddocks, and they're all sizable, uh, you know, sizable. Um, so therefore, it, it does take a lot of manpower, more than we have. And you've got a, how many horses? We have 16 horses and uh, they double up. But this, like I said, this is the second day, so we definitely want to get them uh, get them outside All soon. Right. And this is day two, and as Ashley has let us know, there's more snow coming. So what are you looking for? We would love it if people could just give us an hour of their time with their snow blowers or any kind of snow clearing, even shovels, uh, to help us kind of reduce the snow so that the, the horses can get out safely. And also, just with more snow on the way, we, we don't know again um, we want to get that snow reduced so that we won't face even more issues. Not to mention, this is just the first week of 2020. Mm -hmm. You could have many more paddock shoveling days to come this year. Yes, definitely. So we are in the market for uh, some snow blowing equipment. Um, but uh, right now, a lot of it is just, like you say, the manpower of, of doing nine paddocks. Okay. Is yeah. And uh, if someone wants to help you out, what, what can they do? How do they get a hold of you? If someone wants to help us out, they're more than welcome to just show up here at 103 Mount Sio Road and we'll put them to work um, for any amount of time that they can spare. They can give us a call at 738-1055 and let us know if they want more information regarding uh, details. That would be uh, fine as well. All right, Kelly, thank you very much and good luck. I hope people show up. It is yes. beautiful here. It is beautiful. There's no better place to be than here right now. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, once again, if you'd like to donate some of your time to help dig out the Rainbow Riders and give their horses more room in those nine paddocks, huge amount of space, uh, they need all the help they can get. Kelly says you can just show up, as you heard, bring a shovel at 103 Mount Sio Road in St. John's, or you can call 738-1055 for more details. Well, the St. John's Edge are back for their third season at Mile One Center. The team, though, has gone through a massive transformation rather, with just two players returning from the previous season and one player in particular not there, and that's Carl English. He's notably missing, but nonetheless, tonight is the home opener, and here now is Jeremy Eaton, his courtside. Jeremy. So, Anthony, the season has been underway for a couple of weeks. Uh, the team actually played the first six games of the season on the road. Now, they started with four losses, but they've won their last two games, and tonight they're playing against the KW Titans for, as you said in the intro, the home opener. Now, to join us to talk about this a little bit is co-owner of the team, Rob Sabah. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Rob, it's the third season for the St. John's Edge. How are things looking for your team? Well, we're really happy about where we are. You know, we did get off to, as you said, you know, we lost the first four games. I think we've, we've straightened things out for the next, uh, from uh, the last couple. And we're looking forward to a great crowd tonight and a good show for them. Now, the team the team has changed a lot. Uh, Murphy Bernatowski is back, Junior Cadugan is back, and also Coach Steve Marcus is back. Uh, how happy are you with the team that uh, Tyrone and Steve Marcus have put together here? We are. We're, you know, we're very, we're very happy. We like the team chemistry. We spent some time with the team during the offseason. We spent some time with the team just before. They bonded. You know, it's pretty well documented what it took for them to get back here last night. You know, nothing bonds a team together. <laughs> you know, a nice snowstorm being stuck in an airport with some hotels, some quality time for the last six games. They're a close group. Sorry, can we just elaborate on that a little bit? How hard was it for the team to get back here for the home opener? Oh, it was tough. I mean, you know, I, I, as of 10 o'clock last night, we didn't know what, ho uh, what hotel they were in, how they were going to fly back. They had to fly back. They had three flights canceled. They had to fly back at 7.50 this morning. This team just got in, just really got their legs and uh, shake the cobwebs out, and they're ready to go. So the team had a rough time getting home to get here in time for the home opener. They weren't able to do a shoot around. As the co-owner, did you get a chance to talk to the players, and how yeah. are they feeling about tonight's game, Rob? They feel good, as you can imagine. I, I walked into the trainers' tables. They were laying down. They were catching a little shut-eye, had their radios on, had their uh, 
you know, watching a little TV, getting some well, well deserved rest. But I feel real good about the show they're going to put on tonight. Now, this is the third season for the team. They've enjoyed success the last two years. Why was it important for you to fly in from uh, New York, correct? Yes. Why was it important for you to fly in from New York through a snowstorm to be here for the home opener? Well, you know, and, and my partner Erwin has said it, Erwin Simon said it uh, so many times also. This city has supported us from day one. They've sent us kind messages all the time, phone calls and just the ticket sales and, and everything that this team means to the community. It's the least that we can do is to be here as much as we possibly can. Now, Mr. Sabah, I am going to put you on the spot, but a lot of people watching this uh, are going to want to know, is there a chance? What are the chances we might see Carl English suit up for the edge this year? Wow. Uh, gee, we couldn't get past that, huh? <laughs> you know, right now, all, all coaching decisions are left up to Tyrone and Coach Marcus. Um, and right now we're concentrating on the team we have on the floor. We're really happy. There's no doubt Carl's a great player. He's been nothing but a credit to our organization. And who knows what the future holds. But right now the St. John's Edge is getting ready to tip off, and this is our team. All right. Appreciate your time, Mr. Sabah. Thanks so Thank much you. for everything. And as uh, Mr. Sabah said, tip-off time is about uh, 23 minutes away, and we'll talk to a few fans coming up later on in the show. Reporting live from here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. This time of year, depending on where you live, some might be distressed at the sight of a beached seal stranded on a snowy shoreline. Well, in fact, DFO says there's been a spike in the number of seal sightings reported. But one research scientist says there's little cause for concern about the seals. In fact, he wants people to back off and just leave the seals alone. Here he is speaking with the broadcast's Jane Aidy. You're cautioning people about their behavior around these seals. What should people do or not do if they see a seal out of the water? Well, the most important thing to do is stay away from it. Give it space. These are wild animals. Uh, generally, especially the young ones, they're, you know, they may growl or hiss if you get too close to them, which means you're too close to them. Uh, but generally, just leave them alone. Um, they'll eventually go back on their own. Don't have to worry about them as long as nobody's harassing them or if they've moved into an area where they're unsafe either unsafe to people who are moving by or like we've had instances where they've crawled up on roads and these sorts of things. 
in that case, if somebody's doing harassment or they're in an unsafe position, call your local fishery officer. And he's been trained and has the equipment to move them. And usually what we do is they just move them and, and release them in an isolated area. Uh, any particular area of the province where you're uh, seeing more of this this year? Well, we see seals in, in all around the area. Uh, we, of course, get more reports here around the Avalon because there's more people and they're out more. So in the last couple of weeks, we've got calls from Flat Rock, we've got them from Holyrood, uh, we've got them Bay Roberts, these sorts of things. But it's more an indication of where people are rather than where the seals are. Now, there's a, a growing concern, as you're aware, uh, among fishermen and people who make their living on the water that the seal population is out of control. And they, in, in fact, point to the fact that there are so many seals that are out of the water, you know, maybe in search of food in, in places where they haven't been seen before. Uh, what can you say about that aspect of uh, the seal population and whether or not that has anything to do with why they might be out of the water at this time of year? This has no relationship whatsoever to population size. Um, it, we've had these calls for decades. I've been working on seals for over 30 years and starting from when I began back in the mid 80s, we've had these occasional calls. So you see them around uh, regularly. Uh, every year this happens in some place or another. What it may have more an indication of is lack of ice offshore. Because most of these, like the hoods and the harps, they're, they're generally offshore species. And they'll haul out on the ice. And if you're in the offshore in January, February, you'll often see seals hauled out on ice. If there's no ice around, then the only place they can haul out is on shore. Well, a Winnipeg woman is going grocery free for January. She says it cuts down on food waste and saves her family money. Marjorie Dowhouse has the story. It makes you makes you think um, about what you're eating and what you already have in the house. Colleen Holloway is starting off the new year by challenging herself. You know, January is a tough month sometimes financially after Christmas and I decided to save a few bucks by not going out and buying as many groceries. You realize you have more jam. Holloway is going grocery free for January. The Winnipeg woman has been doing it now for five years. She says it's a challenge to cut down on food waste and declutter her kitchen. We throw out so much food um, as a society and food was never meant to be produced to be thrown out. It was meant to be enjoyed and consumed. Holloway says it's forced her to be creative in what she makes. It also encourages her family to plan out all their meals and prepare them ahead of time. And it's translated into big savings. I would tend to think in an average month, I would probably buy about $350 in food. But I think food costs are something that can creep up on you. Um, I don't go out and buy lunches through the week. We don't go out for dinners during the week. Yeah, this is homemade chicken noodle soup. Holloway says the only exceptions are milk and eggs, which she buys fresh. Five years in, Holloway says she's conscious of buying food that can last longer and be preserved. She also understands the misconception of best before dates. You have to really use common sense. If it doesn't look right, doesn't smell right, you know, then, you know, don't use it. You know, you don't want to make yourself sick. But a lot of the times we are afraid to extend the life of something or try something else. Holloway says she's encouraged some of her friends and other people to take on the challenge. And she's taking to social media to spread the word of shelving a trip to the grocery store in January. Marjorie Dowhouse, CBC News, Winnipeg.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm Jeremy Eaton live at Mile One Center. And that's because the St. John's Edge are playing their home opener of their third season in the NBL Canada. Now, I wanted to find some fans, and I think the biggest fans you could find are the boys who are wearing basketball shorts and hanging out here. So what I want you to do is look into the camera and tell me what your name is and how old you are. I'm Andrew Waterman, and I'm 11 years old. Andrew Waterman, what are you doing down here at Mile One tonight? Um, we're going to be helping out sweeping the floor and handing out drinks and getting balls. And how do you, how do you feel to be able to do that on the big court with the St. John's Edge? Very excited. Perfect. Perfect. Appreciate your time. Now, can you tell everybody who you are? I'm Lincoln Snow, and I'm 10 years old. And Lincoln, how uh, how do you feel to be on the, the big court here at Mile One? I know you've been down to games before, but how do you feel to be standing on the court yourself? I'm pretty excited. It's really excited. fun so far. All right, appreciate your time. What's your name, big guy? My name's Jacob Andrews, and I'm 11 years old. What school do you go to? I go to Paradise Elementary. Can you tell everybody what NLBT means? Next level basketball training. What's What's your favorite thing about basketball? It's just really fun, and it's adrenaline pumping. And do you like the St. John's Edge? Yes, they're my favorite basketball team. Favorite basketball team, even the NBA? Yes. Perfect, man, appreciate your time. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Good. What's my, your name? My name's Ben Nosworthy, and I'm 11. And what school do you go to, Ben? St. Francis of Assisi. And are you excited to be able to give some of these talented basketball players a little sip of water when they get tired? Yeah. So how do you how how did you get invited to do this? How did this come about? Uh, I was asked because I was on a I was on an NLBT team with all these guys, and we were asked to come in to see if we wanted to help out at the Edge game. And are you excited about that? Yeah. And what's your favorite thing about basketball? Oh, uh, the teamwork. Teamwork, out a boy. And last, last but not least, what's your name? Jeffrey Pinson. I'm 11 years old. Jeffrey, uh, how excited are you to be on the court here tonight? Pretty excited. Uh, and do you like the St. John's Edge? Yeah, they're pretty good. Do you have a favorite player? Not really. Not yet, eh? Now these guys, NLB Next Level Basketball Training. Can you show us something? They're going to take a final shot. So whenever you're ready, boys, take a couple of shots. <laughs> All right, hit me up, hit me up, hit me up, hit me up, hit me up. Oh, oh one more time, one more time, one more time. Nothing but one air. Time, one more nothing time. but air. One more time. Rejected. No. Oh, 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 just like real life, rejected. <laughs> it's hard to do it with an arm and a mic. Anthony, it's a lot harder than it looks. That's true. Anyway, it's over so three. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. Anyway, so the, the game's about to get underway here in uh, about 10 or 11 minutes. Uh, you know, the fans are starting to come in for the home opener, so it uh, should be, the team looks a little bit different, but uh, people down here are pretty excited to see the St. John's Edge back in action. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. Can I get one more? The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. She said, nope, Jeremy, Denied. it's weather time. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what are we going to look at now? We're going to talk about Thursday because... Thursday, right. Oh, right. The, we got that system. Right? That's right. So it's going to continue uh, to affect most mm -hmm. of the island as we head through the day on Thursday. So let's take a look at that. Uh, temperatures are going to climb as we head through the overnight. So that's why things are going to change over to rain. But... Quickly, Thursday, uh, early morning hours, you can see everything will change back over to snow. Be heavy at times through parts of the island. And then into Thursday morning, those winds still are going to stay quite strong. So you're still going to see that snow along the west coast for sure. And then up through Labrador, coastal Labrador, really anywhere through central uh, Labrador, through coastal Labrador, along with those flurries, you'll see your winds pick up as well. So gusts near uh, anywhere from 60 to 80 kilometers per hour, certainly not out of the question uh, through the day on Thursday. Just going to bring up this map one more time just to show you where the heaviest snowfall. This is Wednesday through Thursday, uh, 20 to 30 centimeters. It looks like for the southwest northern peninsula, five to 15 centimeters might have to make some tweaks to this tomorrow, but this is what it's looking like right now. And again, 5 to 15 centimeters for parts of eastern Newfoundland. First wave of snow tomorrow, changing to rain, 
back over to snow on Thursday. So uh, as far as looking ahead, uh, temperature wise, zero degrees for Thursday, hovering around there for the St. John's area, or rather the Avalon, heading uh, towards the west, that's where things will cool down. So minus seven for Corner Brook, that's why you're gonna stay as snow. Uh, minus 10 for the Straits, again, with those windy conditions. Minus 19 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So getting back into some of that colder air, certainly for Lab City, you're gonna see sunshine, but sitting around minus 23 through the day on Thursday, and then Nain around minus 21. Looking ahead into Friday, uh, again, that onshore flow is going to continue along the coast to west coast. So you're going to see snow continue pretty much through uh, even into Friday. The next system will roll in quickly, though. It's going to move through, bring in the potential for some snow. Then we're watching or I'm watching one on Saturday. So this one, not a lot of agreement. Uh, but right now, this is what some of the models are suggesting that we could see some rain move in. Big push of warm air. This will be overnight into Sunday morning. That's when you'll see uh, most of that push of warm air. If this is the track, if not, it looks like there's a potential for it to just skirt uh, the southern half of the island. So that means that this could be snow, but there's a heads up. There's the next system coming up through Labrador, though. Good chance that'll stay as snow. And then the next uh, on Sunday, rather, will stay snow as well. So here's where we'll be sitting over the next five days. A little bit of a roller coaster temperature wise above zero, then well below zero and then back up hovering around the zero degree mark is to finish out the weekend. Uh, for central Newfoundland, this is pretty much the same, uh, but you're gonna stay below zero except until Saturday, and that's if that big push of warm air will move in, but you'll notice a significant drop in temperatures uh, overnight Sunday as we get into some of that colder air, and that colder air is gonna stay up through uh, Labrador. Generally, not too bad, just a chance of flurries both Thursday and Saturday, otherwise sunshine and temperatures in the minus teens. And then for Western Labrador, uh, temperature is going to be cold. Thursday night, minus 29, minus 30 by the time you hit Sunday. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Well, new research suggests there's a key step to fight a health issue that affects more than half a million Canadians. With dementia on the rise in this country, aerobic exercise is proving to bring benefits beyond the body and boosting the brain. Here's the, the CBC's Christine Birak reports. Each and every person here is sweating it out for their own reasons. They're here to be active, to get fit, to look good, to get stronger. German researchers track the fitness of more than 2,000 adults aged 21 to 83 over four years. They found those who did moderate intensity regular exercise not only improved their heart health but also their brain. MRI scans showed physical activity was associated with increased gray matter or brain tissue, which is responsible for memory and cognition. Trying to keep your gray matter thick, trying to keep your gray matter uh, healthy is important. And that's why I think that this particular study does provide a worthwhile contribution. And it suggests that exercise may be the best bet to keep dementia at bay. Scientists believe inflammation or swelling in our brain causes memory loss. Studies have shown physical activity increases the release of natural substances that fight inflammation and also increases blood flow to the brain. Research has also found inactivity contributes to dementia risk as much as genetics. You can't change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. So how much exercise are we talking? 30 minutes, five days a week for a total of 150 minutes. Running, biking, swimming will get you there easily. But walking and even stair climbing or household chores like shoveling or sweeping will also work as long as you break a sweat. Good job. The study also found exercise benefits the brain at any age, but especially in those over 45. Stacy Michalidis says her dad is mentally sharp and inspires her. My father um, was a role model. He's 86 and he has been working out my whole life. Building your body and your brain. Yet another reason to get moving. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. I have a feeling a lot of us uh, feel pretty much the same about this photo. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have an idea of where this is too, but I'll tell you coming up. That's, that's our father of fallen snow. It is. <laughs>
So let's go right to the picture let's that we showed it. you before the break. How great is that photo? They've noticed. <laughs> Father, forgive me, for they know not what they've done to my shovel. The poor man's shovel's busted. It's busted, yeah. So worn out, but not sure in which order. <laughs> <laughs> Did he? <laughs> this looks like, oh, someone. So funny. Looking for divine help. All right, well, yeah. earlier in the show, we introduced you to a little guy whose shovel was totally intact, and his shovel wasn't broken, but uh, kind of ran out of batteries. Yeah. Rory from Clarenville. Let's take a look at I Rory think... one more time in the show. There he is. Going, going. Bonk. <laughs> I can't. It's just too adorable. But I love the way as soon as his dad gets him stood up again, he just keeps, he just keeps going, going right again. <laughs> Blunk, dad, dad. Okay, okay, okay. I'm ready. Just wind me up and away he goes. <laughs> oh, absolutely adorable. You're, oh, all gonna Rory. Be watching, you're all going to be watching that you over are, and over and over again. You are going to be one of the most famous toddlers in the world. <laughs> All right, we'll say good night to you now. Well, I'll be burying our heads in the snow as this new system's coming up. <laughs> Let Rory be your example. Don't stop. <laughs> Keep shoveling. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>